Hi everybody, it's Scott here again, and in this, the third video about sandcasting, we're going to talk you through some of the design considerations that you need to bear in mind when you're designing your parts to be made using the sandcasting process. The main thing that you need to consider when you're designing uh, your parts and the patterns of your parts for moulding using the sandcasting technique is to provide a draft angle so that you can actually pull your pattern out of the sand mould um, once you're forming it. So we've provided four different examples um, shown here. We've got two examples of uh, kind of cylindrical parts that are quite similar and also two examples of a T-shaped part that we might be manufacturing. And we're going to talk through um, the four different processes uh, that would be made to manufacture these parts. And I should point out that these little herring bones that you see here indicate the parting line or the parting plane for each of these different um, parts which we would be casting. So this um, is kind of like the cross hatching representing one side of our box which would be up here and the other cross hatching in the other direction represents another sandbox underneath and so this um, shorthand is used to um, designate the parting line um, when we're talking about sand casting processes so let's have a look at this second example here and talk through the way in which uh, this part has been designed so that it can be actually cast using the sand casting process so our herring bones designate that we have a parting line or a parting plane along this um, plane of the part. So it's going to cut through the bottom of the part and the top section of the part. And you'll notice, unlike this version of the part over here, which has parallel sides all the way through, this example in B has actually got a taper going down the sides of the outside surfaces of this cylindrical part here. And so that is to allow us when we're trying to remove this half of our pattern from the sand, because we have that drafting angle, we can actually pull that away without breaking off and rolling up the sand due to having parallel sides. So whenever we're designing um, parts like this, we need to think about where we're putting our parting line and then look at it and make sure that we don't have any uh, edges or faces that are perpendicular to this parting line. They all need to be uh, slightly tapered um, with this draft angle so that they can be pulled out. Let's have a look at this fourth example over here. So this is a, a T-shaped part that we're manufacturing. And in this example, we've got our parting line going through the center of the part this way, which means that we have to add a draft angle to this uh, side face of the part and also these faces here and here to ensure that when we're pulling that half of our pattern out of the sand, it can come away cleanly. So that's how we do that one. Another option um, in the case of this particular geometry is to mold this part using what we call a one piece pattern. So we only have cavities molded into the sand on one side of this pattern. We still have sand over here, but we don't have any indentations in it. It's just flat on this side. We can do that because we've got this flat surface here and then we can actually shape this so that it has adequate draft angles on all these faces to allow us to pull this one out of the sand as well. So that's a different option to do it. And generally, if we have the choice of doing a single sided pattern like this, we would probably do so because it cuts down on our work and our handling of these pattern parts. In this first example over here, um, we've chosen to split this part in a different way. Because we've got a circle, we can actually split it uh, across the circle this way. And even though it's technically um, a vertical surface right on the edges here, uh, we find from experience that it's actually possible to pull out a semicircular shape out of the sand without dislodging too much of the sand at these corners if we're careful. And so this is an acceptable way generally of modeling um, a circular shaped part. So our half pattern would pull out like such. The circular shape provides enough draft angle in itself. We should note that these two examples here, the cylindrical ones, they have um, a parallel hole running through the center of them, and that would be made uh, using a core that would be inserted uh, into this mold before we poured the metal in. And cores, because they're a separate part, uh, we can actually make them parallel, and so you can cast these ones um, if you're using the core. However, if you're using just the sand in the box, then any of these recesses would have to be um, 
have a draft angle included on them as well. But generally we would use cores for, for those type of um, internal hollows. If we look into the use of cores in a little bit more detail on some more complex examples, uh, we should remember that if a core must be used inside your part, then we usually have to provide some core prints uh, within our pattern to be able to support this core within the mold and to be able to keep it in place when we pour the metal in. So for this top example here, uh, we've got this cantilevered um, beam, which is probably holding something out here and then attached to a wall or something. We've designed this example with this hollow section in the center, and to achieve that hollow section, we'd actually need to insert a core into this when we're making the sandbox. Unfortunately, if we just stick a core in there loosely, then um, there's nothing to hold that core in the center of this cross section, so it's just gonna fall down and sit at the bottom of our cavity, which is not what we want. We're not gonna get the part that we've designed. And so we need some way of supporting this core in the right position and making sure it doesn't move. And to do that, we would need to add a considerably large core extension, um, which will support the core within the sand and then allow the bit that's going into the part to be cantilevered out into space before we actually pour the metal in there. So if we do that, it's now supported by the sand over here. And we've also moved the center of gravity of this core um, over to where it's actually got some support. And so it's less likely to move around and even break off or fall in there. Where possible, we want to try and avoid having to use cores at all. They're an extra step, they're an extra mold that we have to make and more sand that we have to prepare and it's extra labor. So if we can actually design our part so as to eliminate the use of cores, then we'll usually do that um, where it's possible. So in the lower example that we see here, this is basically the same functional part. It's got um, this mount hanging out, cantilevered out in space and this pad which would go against the wall or something. It essentially performs the same function, but due to its design with this H cross-sectional pattern, we've managed to eliminate the use of the core in here while still achieving, say, the same stiffness and strength targets for a similar, similar if not lighter uh, weight in this case, simply by being smart about how we've designed our casting. We can't actually have these perpendicular surfaces running perpendicular to our parting line here so we would have to actually add a draft angle on those to make sure that we could pull this pattern out of the sand so that's what we've done there and by using this design we should have successfully eliminated the use of our core so in this photograph on the right hand side we have an example of a part that we're molding this is the the shape of the part here and it's going to be molded uh, in the sand casting technique using this two piece pattern so we've split this pattern into two pieces which mounts together using holes and a pin on the left hand side of the picture we have the mold which is used to make the core out of sand so this is a core that would come out of this mold um, once we've baked the sand in the oven so this is nice and rigid and it's even got an additional um, bit of wire going through there to give it some extra support and down the end of the component here, we have our core print. So this is not actually the part at all. You can see that this is, doesn't come out in the final part, but it's gonna be completely filled by the sand here in our core. So that's how you can tell what's a core print. If um, the core is the same size, then it's gonna fill it completely. And so that's why it's a core print. So in this final part, you can see this is the bit that we're interested here, um, and it's going to be hollow because the internal cavity is filled up um, predominantly by the sand, and then we have the shell of metal around the outside. And this bit here is the gate and the sprue and probably part of the runner as well. And this is basically where all the metal has come, come into the part, and we would cut this off and, and throw this um, back in the pot and melt it down and use it again in the next casting. Aside from considering our draft angle, which is the most important thing, we also need to think about a couple of other things. One of them is that we should always try and keep the thickness of the metal part that we're casting fairly uniform to prevent shrinkage cracks. So what happens if you look at, say, the example on the left here, if we're casting this component here, it has um, a thin um, wall of metal here and then a thicker wall down here. 
Now when we pour all the metal in, the thinner walls are going to shed their heat more quickly into the sand that's surrounding it, and so they're going to cool off and harden up quicker, whereas the thicker areas of the part are going to take longer, and this can lead to cracking in the corners due to the different rates and times taken for cooling, and they, they can also curl up um, if this cooling takes uh, a very different amount of time. So rather than having these different thickness variations in our part, where possible we need to try and design it so that we have a consistent thickness all the way through our part um, so that everything cools at the same rate and we can try and avoid some of these shrinkage cracks. So if we did need that thickness for, say, structural reasons, a way that we could um, avoid having that thickness and still meet our structural targets is to include things like um, a web in here, which is going to add some bending stiffness out to this edge. Um, and this, can, this web here can also be the same thickness as the rest of the part, so it will cool at the same rate. We have another example below here, so it's a little bit th thinner on these walls than it is on this big boss in the center. And so again, we might thin down um, that section, that flange there, and then add a few webs around the circumference of our part to give us the required stiffness while keeping that uh, thickness relatively constant throughout the part. So we should avoid these thick to thin regions and instead go for uniform thickness all the way through with the addition of stiffening ribs if we require them. For the same reasons, if we look at the example again on the right hand side, we wouldn't want to make this component um, completely solid. If we were to just fill that with metal, then there's going to be a big variation in the thickness throughout this part. And it's also going to waste a lot of metal, which we um, potentially don't need. It's not being very efficiently used. We don't have a good eye value um, through solid sections, it's much better to have hollow sections or I-beams or H-beams or things like that. So this would be a waste of um, material and it's probably going to give us problems in the casting process. So that would typically be avoided because um, it's costly and we don't want it to go thick to thin. In this example at the bottom, we want this part to have a hole through it um, here in the final part. We may choose to cast that as a solid and drill it out later, but if we were very conscious of um, the thick to thin and we might have issues there, we could also choose to use a core in this place um, if we thought uh, it warranted the extra effort to actually put that in there. Um, so that's an option that we could use there. The third thing that we should keep in mind when we're designing parts to be cast is that the casting process in sand is not terribly accurate. Um, we've got to pull these patterns out and that can move the sand around a little bit and it's not going to be perfectly repeatable every time and so we should anticipate uh, that each time we do this there could be a couple of millimetres um, difference in these surfaces and also the surfaces aren't going to be beautifully machined flat and smooth. They're going to have a bit of graininess due to uh, the roughness of the sand which we're going to have in the final part. So in the places on our part where we require a nice flat surface finish, particularly to bolt to other things, like maybe over here and also on the top and bottom of this and in this hole, we need to consider and allow for some machining afterwards. This is commonly called post-machining. If we just sandcast the part to the final dimensions and then we need to go and machine it, we're going to actually um, make some of these features undersized. So we need to think ahead and allow what we call machining allowance in our casting to give us some material to cut into to get it to the final um, dimensions that we want. So in this case, we might fill that block out solid and then machine down um, to the black and white image that you see there. Also on the back face here, we might add some extra material, a couple of millimetres, so that we can machine that flat afterwards and get a nice surface finish on the back. In this example, we've shown what it might look like if we have a slightly smaller core than the hole size that we require, and then we go and we finish machine that hole after it's been cast, and then mill flat surfaces on these faces. We'll talk more about machining in uh, the coming weeks, and also some machining allowance on that back face there. Looking at these four examples on the right hand side, we see some recommendations for how you should provide your machining allowance so as not to disrupt the casting process. So in this case, if that surface of this part needed to be flat, then we can allow a bit of extra material and machine it down there, that's fine. Um, on this one here, if we want that surface flat, we can apply some more material in the corner and machine down to it. 
What we can't do is this example C here is put a little pad of material up here because our pattern therefore becomes undercut. So when we try and pull this out of the sand, the sand that's actually sitting in here is going to be pulled out. And so we're actually going to pull out um, a whole lot more of that and we're going to, we're going to mess up um, the sand. So we can't actually do that. If we did need machining allowance there, then we have to add it all the way down into that bottom corner. We can't have this undercut, uh, which is shown there. So a few examples of the right ways and the wrong ways to add machining allowance to your parts. The other point that we should touch on is that we don't want to add too much excess material that we then have to spend a lot of time and effort cutting away later at the machining stage. So if we had quite a large surface area like the one over here, if all of that had to be machined flat, then that's going to take us longer. We're going to go through more um, machining tools to do that. And maybe we're not getting any additional benefits from having all of that surface flat. So in those kind of cases, we might want to have a smaller area like this where we add the machining allowance, um, but just enough to give us the support or the flatness in the regions that we require them. So an example here is this um, bearing mount, and you can see on the bottom here, um, they've added a pad of material here, which can be machined flat later on where the bolt holes are going to bolt up, and so it pulls up nice and flat against whatever surface it's attaching to. Now, this pad of extra material could have been added all the way through, but that would have resulted in a lot more material used in the casting over a big production run and also um, more time to machine it flat. And it's really not doing anything in the center of the mount here. It's better to have this material at the outside edges where it would rotate about and where the bolt holes are. And so we abstain from actually adding machining allowance material in that region. Finally, I'd like to show you an example of what we might typically see come out of the sand. Once we've done our casting and we pull the part out, this is what we might be presented with. And I just wanted to challenge you to try and look at this and think about it and try and figure out quickly what you think it might be. And I'll give you some clues. So the first clue that I'm going to provide is that it actually has a, a core inside it. So this at the end here is the core print where the core would have sat and it has a core running all the way through it um, which is going to have a variable cross section go all the way around to here so that is the first hint this is a hollow part and this core is going to be the same on both sides of this um, cast part so a couple more seconds have a think about it do you recognize the shape what might it be well this is what um, this part actually is. So it's a tap, uh, quite a gourmet one that you might find in your house or a classy hotel perhaps. And this has actually been made by the casting process. Let's have a look at some of the features on this part. So up the top here, this is where we've poured the metal in. So this is the runner system or the sprue. And so the metal has been poured in and then it's flowed into the parts here and it's gone around the core and gone all the way down into the bottom here. These um, thin, sharp, additional bits of metal where the metal is actually run between uh, the two sides, the two halves of our sand cast, that's commonly referred to as flashing or flash just so that you know for future reference, if ever anyone ever talks about flash or flashing, that's uh, what it is. And we can usually break this off afterwards. So for this part to be finished, we would um, cut away uh, these bits of the sprue and the runner and cut off the end bits, cut off this excess material down here, throw, this, throw that excess material back into the pot and reuse it. There would be some machining processes um, to add threads and whatever else um, that these require for the final form. And then it would be uh, chrome plated for the finished product there. One question you might ask is, why would we make two of these at once? Well, if you think about it, we have this very long core, which we need to support here at either end. So if we're going to have that supported, it's probably easier for us to make it um, in one continuous piece that goes all the way around uh, like an inverted love heart like that. So that's maybe one of the reasons uh, two of them are actually made at once. It simplifies the production of the core and it gives it more support. It's nicely balanced. We don't need to have a big um, mass of core print hanging out on this side to, to counterweight 
uh, each sides because it's symmetrical. That's the end of this casting video. Thanks for watching.